Bill Mobley for the Brain Channel and uh, very pleased to have Fatah Nahab, who's an associate professor in neurosciences in the Movement Disorders Program. And Fatah, welcome. Thank you. Uh, glad you're here. Tell us a little bit about your background, if you will. Sure. So I'm originally from Southern California, uh, did my undergraduate training locally, and then in medical school I actually did my medical training at the Loma Linda University School of Medicine, did my internship in psychiatry, and then I did my uh, residency in neurology, and then I went on to the National Institutes of Health where I spent a pretty long time there training in human movement, uh, both normal and abnormal, as well as neuroimaging, and uh, joined the faculty here about three years ago, and uh, it's good to be here. Well, it's great that you are here. It, we've really benefited so much by your being here. The, the approach that you take in movement disorders is, is a little unusual. Tell us about what you think your big problem with respect to movement disorders is and how you're tackling that. Sure. So from my point of view, I think the clinic informs my research and my research informs the clinic, and so it's really a two-way street. Um, during routine clinical practice, I see many patients with Parkinson's. It's a normal assumption that people with Parkinson's have problems with walking. But what I realized in seeing patients is many people have problems walking, and it wasn't very clear that it was simply the Parkinson's that was the cause. And so we had an idea. We started looking at brain scans of patients both with Parkinson's and without Parkinson's, who seemed to have a decline in their walking function, trying to see what may be some of the predictors for this. Um, and I think we hit on some very interesting things in the process. So what were the differences versus Parkinson's disease for these other patients that you were seeing? You know, all of us as humans have this perception that as we get older, that one of the hits to our health is going to be a decline in walking. Mm -hmm. um, and I think most people assume that that's because of arthritis, their joints, they're maybe a little bit weaker, just not as much energy, but that's not exactly what we found. And what we found is actually that the brain plays a much larger role in the decline of walking than we previously realized. And it really makes sense because if you think about walking, um, it's really the second most complex function that the brain does, really after language and kind of thinking. So it's not surprising that when you injure the brain in various ways, and we can talk about that later, that one of the things that starts to decline very rapidly is walking. Yeah. You know, so not all changes in walking are due to Parkinson's disease. In fact, it's a very distributed motor system, right? It involves uh, basal ganglia, it involves uh, rubro motor function, red nucleus, it involves cerebellum. This is a hugely complicated system. And you could easily imagine that different patients would have different kinds of problems with that. It's even more broadly distributed than language and thinking from that point of view because you can start all the way up at the cortex where walking is planned yes. and will is initiated, carried out by the basal ganglia in terms of the motor programs, um, going down to the brainstem in terms of what you mentioned, uh, balance, posture, mm -hmm. that sort of thing, coordination, and then out the spinal cord mm -hmm. to the peripheral nerves, the muscles, and so it really covers the entire expanse of the nervous system and just as you indicated, hits at different regions actually lead to different sorts of declines in walking function. But one of the things that we found is that there was actually a lot more similarity than we expected between Parkinson's and simple aging. Hmm. Um, and when we looked at the different contributors to that, there were actually many areas that were in common and localized to the brain. Interesting. So if I take a subset of aging, that's Parkinson's disease, but the larger set of aging goes beyond Parkinson's Absolutely. disease. Absolutely. Right. Um, in a distributed network like this, literally uh, each weak link in the chain, if you will, can lead to problems. What have you found? 
So in the imaging studies that we started looking at, and this was very open-ended, we didn't have any particular hypotheses, um, it's quite common as we get older that on a brain MRI, just a routine brain MRI anybody can get clinically, there will be these little white dots in the brain mm -hmm. that are called white matter hyperintensities. Right. And on a typical radiology report, these things are normally reported as normal age-related changes, mm -hmm. okay? So there's not a very good association with any particular pathology. When these things develop, they tend to be silent. Mm -hmm. And so you're not going to notice symptoms like you would in a larger stroke or some sort of other insult to the brain. And so these things can develop literally over decades of time. And what we, what we found is there's a very direct correlation in terms of the number of these white dots in the brain and the decline in walking function. And that was a better predictor of than how many years people had Parkinson's. It was a better predictor than how many symptoms of Parkinson's they had or how severe they were. It's a better predictor than their medication response. And so it was actually much more common across the entire population that we studied, and it wasn't specific to Parkinson's. Right, so a distributed system affected in a distributed manner mm -hmm. really is predictive of the problems with walking. So how do you study that? How do you, how do you get beyond that important, uh, not global, but certainly uh, impressive uh, look at things to come up with ideas about how to study it? So I think one of the first things that we were interested in is we know that the network is very large, but are there particular aspects of the network that seem to be getting hit more frequently than other aspects? Mm -hmm. And we found that to be the case. Um, there is a region called the periventricular white matter, and the ventricles are the areas where spinal fluid is produced. And it's right around these regions right here where when we compared people with walking problems to people without walking problems, the people with the problems seem to have much greater white matter hyperintensities or these white dots in those particular regions. And so we went back to the literature, and the literature basically says that there may be an association between these things and walking or these things and even cognition. Mm -hmm but it wasn't entirely clear what's going on in terms of this network that we're, what we're concerned about and that we're studying. And so we decided to work a little bit backwards and to try to see where these white matter tracks can be traced back to. Mm. And when we used something called diffusion tensor imaging, which allows you to trace out the white matter tracks in the brain, we could actually work our way backwards and see that a particular region of the brain called the supplementary motor area, mm. which is very important for motor planning, but is involved with cognition as well. Sure. Um, this is the outflow of the supplementary motor area. And so it shows us that this is why people, both with Parkinson's and without pro uh, Parkinson's, have difficulties with things like initiating walking. Mm or maintaining walking when they stop thinking about it mm -hmm. because these planning centers in the brain are affected. Very interesting. What do you do with, for an individual patient with a, with a signature like this in the periventricular white matter? So uh, that's a great question and that's something that we're actively studying right now. Um, the first thing is to figure out what exactly these white dots are in the yeah. brain and yeah. what's causing them. and the medical community doesn't really have a clear answer for that. Um, historically, people have assumed these are due to either poorly controlled diabetes or poorly controlled high blood pressure. And in many of the patients that we have with these, uh, these lesions, that is the case. But in some patients where we didn't find that, we would actually go back and try to look more deeply to try to see do they have prediabetes, are they actually having occasional periods of high blood pressure? And even in those cases, we find those things to be true, mm -hmm. even though they're not symptomatic of the typical symptoms of diabetes or high blood pressure. But at the end of the day, we don't really know whether those are the primary causes. 
whether there's something else that's going on. And so the efforts clinically at this time, in my practice at least, are to try to reduce risk factors related to things like stroke and track these changes over time with the hope that we can stabilize them and basically freeze the walking dysfunction in its tracks. And in terms of pathogenesis, beyond uh, basically mitigating risk factors, how do you study this in people? So if this network really is the primary source, we're at a very exciting time, both in movement disorders and neuroscience in general, um, where we may be able to probe this particular network with things like transcranial magnetic stimulation, mm -hmm. trying to see if we temporarily interrupt this network can we actually induce a decline in gait or walking? Mm -hmm. um, and then the reverse mm -hmm. is to try to see whether it's possible to build devices, brain stimulators, for example, mm -hmm. that could be able to enhance the excitability of this region and simplistically describing it as maybe turning up the volume mm -hmm. when the different parts of the network aren't talking to each other as well, mm -hmm. could we get them to talk louder and actually be able to improve function as well? Very exciting. What, what um, if you look at fMRI in these regions, in these uh, people with difficulty with walking, do you see a larger, a smaller, or just a different signal? So we have used functional MRI to actually look at how well these areas talk with each other, mm -hmm. and that's called functional connectivity. Right. And when you look at the fun functional connectivity between these regions, they really aren't talking as well to each other. And so it's exactly what we would have predicted. Right. And so really the next series of uh, studies are gonna be focused on trying to make that better. Exactly. You wonder, as the brain changes, whether there is an earlier, before you look at it, an earlier compensatory change in these regions that you might actually use to predict eventual decline in walking. But we're not there yet. Well. People have looked at it both with imaging and with other technologies. Mm -hmm. um, in our particular studies, we use accelerometers that we'll fasten to the legs mm -hmm. to look at the stride and to see whether there are any inconsistencies. And one thing is called stride variability, and you get changes in stride variability as walking starts to decline at the very earliest stages. And so that is one marker, I think, in an era right now of technology being ubiquitous, mm -hmm. um, wearables are yeah. starting to be used. Mm. And so the technology companies, I think, are very interested in using devices that they're selling to the, mass, uh, the masses to see whether we may be able to predict earlier the onset of various neurological disorders, among other things. Um, in terms of imaging, that has been studied to a lesser degree. But what you alluded to, I think, is correct and similar to other areas such as Alzheimer's, um, where you do get early overcompensation mm -hmm. that then leads to this lack of communication that develops over time. One of the really interesting things about the brain is that um, in advance of clinical symptoms, one sees uh, compensatory responses. And I think, uh, my sense is that this is an emerging area. If we go back far enough, we'll understand that some patients will actually show these early compensatory changes, perhaps early enough that we can intervene in a way that pr protects them and prevents them from having the underlying symptoms that they ultimately suffer. It's exciting. Tell me more about what's going on in your life and in your clinic. This is fun for you, enjoy this business. I do, I do. I really, my clinic is almost a research clinic. Yeah. Um, patients are some of the uh, best givers of mm. uh, inspiration and ideas. Mm. Um, and uh, so we share discoveries and uh, they give me new ideas. Um, and it's a wonderful experience. I'm very fortunate to have the job that I do. and. Uh, always trying to think of new and innovative ways of uh, doing things better. And so um, I think medicine is at a very exciting time right now where we have lots of research developments that have yet to be translated into the clinic. And so we're trying to do that while at the same time
trying to bridge the technology gap between medicine and the tech industry. And so that's another area that I'm very interested in and uh, working with a number of device companies to try to bring that into the clinic. We're proud of you and we're proud that you're here at UCSD. And I thank you for joining the Brain Channel.